Today, I'm gonna rank every main series protagonist in Pokemon, and we're gonna figure out who is the strongest. So, here we go. Also, this video is sponsored by Bloodline Heroes of Lithus, but we'll get into that in a bit. All right, from all of the research I've done, I'm sad to say that Hilda is the weakest protagonist coming in at number 11. Oh, and just for a quick note, I'm only choosing one character from each game, and the character I choose is either the stronger counterpart or the more prevalent counterpart seen in official Pokemon media. So yeah, with that said, let's go over Hilda's feats and see where the bar begins. All right, let's start with the fact that Hilda clashed with Inn on several occasions. And even though Inn is a champion level trainer, she always came out victorious, even when Inn was temporarily a champion at one point. She also dismantled Team Plasma by reforming Inn and defeating Getsis. Though, to be fair, there were a lot of help from local gym leaders and even Looker from the Looker Burrow. So this feat isn't as impressive as, let's say, Red defeating the entirety of Team Rocket single-handedly. And lastly, probably her best feat is that she defeated three champion level trainers, with the trainers being Alder, Inn, and Cynthia. And let me tell you, defeating Cynthia is no easy task. She is unbelievably strong in the lore of Pokemon. But on the same note, Alder is probably the weakest champion of the whole bunch. I even ranked him as the weakest in my top 10 strongest champion video. So defeating him at his old age, probably at his weakest, isn't as impressive. Though beating Cynthia is still a massive feat. All right, let's jump into her ultimate Pokemon team. And I think she would most likely have Imbor, Reshram, Volcarona, Haxtris, Semisage, and possibly Victini. For Imbor, it is probably her starter Pokemon because it is seeing promotional art as a Tepig with her. And since it's her starter Pokemon, it's probably gonna be very high leveled and strong. For Reshram, she canonically has to either defeat it or capture it to progress the story. And I know it's Reshram and not Zekrom because in episode 4 of Pokemon Evolutions, she is seen holding a Light Stone. And as we know, Reshram and Zekrom take on this form when they're dormant. And as for Reshram's power, it is definitely among the strongest dragon type Pokemon to ever exist, since it was once considered the original dragon that plagued the region. Also, Reshram has a Pokedex entry that states that it can scorch the world on fire and even change weather throughout the entire world. So it's more than likely a surface level threat. And when I say surface, it's probably a threat to the ecosystems around the world. For Volcarona, it's likely that she either received it as an egg on Route 18, or more likely encountered it inside the Relic Castle. And it is stated in Volcarona's Pokedex entry that its fire can act as a replacement for the sun. But that's really up to interpretation. It could either mean that its fire is bright enough to replace the sun, or it's powerful enough to entirely replace the sun. And if it's the latter, then Volcarona's skills would be incredibly strong, but it's not confirmed. For Haxtris, I'm going to assume that the axe you show in the battle subway in the promotional art belongs to Hilda, since it's more on her side than Hilbert's side. For Simisage, since she chose Tepeg as her starter, she most likely received the Pan Sage in the Dream Yard. And finally, for Victini, she is shown in promotional art with this Pokemon. And for the event, you do receive a Victini, so it is entirely possible that I join her team. And it is said in Spotus at 3 that trades with Victini always win, regardless of the type of encounter. So if this is true, then I guess Hilda would canonically be the strongest protagonist, since she cannot lose. Though, I I have my doubts, and along with that, it's up in the air if Hilda even owns a Victini. And furthermore, there has been no record of any trainer in any main series Pokemon game that owns a Victini, so the feat hasn't been proven yet. So yeah, we've talked about her feats and her Pokemon team, now I'm going to go over the last category, which is extra. And this is for anything that could potentially give the protagonist an edge in scaling them. And with Hilda, there really isn't anything besides the Victini shenanigans, and I highly doubt that that's canon. So with that said, let's move on. And before we continue, I just want to tell you guys a little bit about Bloodline Heroes of Lithus. It's a game where you it's collect- It's a game where you draw a line with your blood. No. No, that, that's not it at all. Well, that's lame. Okay. Well, anyways, Bloodline Heroes of Lithus is a hero collector fantasy RPG where you collect champions and build kingdoms. But the really cool part about this game is that you can create hairs for your houses by combining various bloodlines like orcs, lichens, demons, and even dragonborn. Yeah, and, and then you draw a line with their blood. Meaning me, there is no drawing of blood anywhere in this game. It's called Bloodline because you're mixing different races to create new ones. Like, look at this. We're going to marry this demon and this demigod to create. What's happening? They're, uh, they're, they're, they're holding hands. And then boom, we have Fred, the chosen one. Okay, wait, so you're telling me this game is all about the bloodline of your family tree. And the more they hold hands, the more cool hairs you can create. Uh, yeah, exactly. And the best part about it is that there are several bloodline clans to choose from, like Wood Elves, Dragonborn, Demigods, Lycans, and even Succubuses. Damn, I wanna hold her hand. Yeah. Anyways, the higher your companion's intimacy is, the more powerful your offspring become. And the more you grow your family tree, the more unique abilities you can unlock through certain combinations that you'll figure out along the way. Oh wow, and look at those graphics. Damn, look at that. This game is really easy to play too. If you're just starting out, I definitely recommend trying out the Lycanus clan, a clan full of werewolves that are assassins. And if you use my link down below, you can start your family tree with Karg the Dragonborn, as well as a half Dragonborn, half Demigod hybrid for free. 
Yeah, so download Blood Light Heroes of Lithus today, and I'll even give you an exclusive starter pack worth $20 using the link down below. Dang, Mini Me, that's, that's really nice of you. And also, big shout out to Bloodline for sponsoring this video. Really appreciate it, guys. And yeah, with that said, let's get back into the video. Alright, next up, we have a lane for Pokemon Let's Go. And yes, for some reason, Pokemon Let's Go is listed as a main series Pokemon game on the official Pokemon website. So, it's fair game for Elaine. Now, Elaine is pretty strong because, just like with Red, she plays a big role in taking down Team Rocket. Though, unlike Red doing it essentially single-handedly, Elaine is given a lot of help. Because not only does she get help from Trace for a few battles, but Blue himself offers help and even says that he'll loop around the Kanto region squashing any Team Rocket member that he comes across. And there's even a time where Elaine is jumped by four Team Rocket grunts and is essentially saved by Lorelei who offers to battle three of them while Elaine just takes on one. So, Elaine got the help from Trace, Blue, and the Elite Four from the Pokemon League. So, this achievement is nowhere comparable to Red's Team Rocket achievement from his timeline. But speaking of Red, in this timeline, Elaine canonically defeats him after becoming champion. But here's where things get confusing. Let me lay it out so it's easier to understand. There are actually two versions of Red. There is Red for Pokemon Red, Blue, Heart Gold, and Soul Silver, where he took down Team Rocket, became champion, and is canonically defeated by Ethan on Mount Silver three years later. And then there's Red from this timeline, the timeline that takes place in Pokemon Let's Go and Ultra Sun and Moon, where Red doesn't take down Team Rocket, has access to Mega Evolution, and eventually becomes the Battle Legend trainer for the Battle Tree in the Alola region. And among the two Reds, this Red by far is the stronger version. And if you're wondering how I connected this Red with the Ultra Sun and Moon Red, it is because the Trial Captain B Mina makes an appearance in the Let's Go games, essentially connecting the timelines. And of course, he has a Mega Venusaur in both Let's Go and Ultra Sun and Moon. So, to put it simply, Elaine defeating Red in Let's Go is a pretty big feat because Red is pretty dang powerful in this timeline. However though, it does get a little bit messier, and I promise, this is the last thing. Red in Let's Go is a lot younger than Red in Ultra Sun and Moon, probably by 10 to 15 years. So Elaine defeating a younger Red in Pokemon Let's Go is a lesser feat than Ely defeating the older Red in Ultra Sun and Moon. So to put it simply, once again, the ranking of times Red has been defeated by a protagonist is Ely above Elaine and Elaine above Ethan. So take that as you will, and let's move on to her ultimate Pokemon team. So with her team, I think she would have a Pikachu, Eevee, Rapidash, Blastoise, Venusaur, and, of course, Mewtwo. With Pikachu, it is assumed that it helped Elaine capture Mewtwo in Pokemon Evolutions Episode 8. And like in Let's Go, this Pikachu would be a partner Pokemon, which would mean that it has enhanced stats and exclusive moves. With Eevee, it is shown with Elaine in promotional art, so it is assumed that she has both Pikachu and Eevee as partner Pokemon. And just like with Pikachu, it would also have exclusive moves and enhanced stats as well. With Mewtwo, it is a mandatory capture in Let's Go, so she definitely canonically owns one, and it's even shown in Pokemon Evolutions with her battling with it against Green. And since Green gives her the Mega Stones from Mewtwo, that means she has access to Mega Mewtwo X or Y, which in that state is considered to be one of the strongest Pokemon to ever exist, so it's definitely her strongest Pokemon. And with Rapidash, Elaine battles with one in Pokemon Evolutions, and with Blastoise and Venusaur, they are seen promotional art with Elaine as a Squirtle and a Bulbasaur. And yeah, that's pretty much Elaine. I ranked her above Hilda simply because she's a Mega Mewtwo and she defeated Red. So let's move on to the next one. Next up, we have Rosa from Pokemon Black and White 2. And I will say Rosa is barely above Elaine and probably could be argued to be weaker than her. But for my list, I think she has the edge. Now, just like all protagonists, she was vital to taking down her respective villainous team, which was Team Plasma. She defeated members all across the region, infiltrated their ship, and defeated Kores, the Shadow Triad, and finally gets this, who effectively battles her with a full team of six plus a controlled Kiram. Though a glaring event that hurts Rosa's rep with Team Plasma is that Gedis nearly killed her, and would have killed her, not possibly, she would have actually died if Indy had come and rescued her with his Restroom or Zekrom. So when you look at this feat from that perspective, she was given a lot of help, and even then some from Hugh throughout the way. Another feat for her resume is that she defeated Iris, which is a little prodigy. I even ranked her just behind Red in my Strongest Champions video, because in only two years she trains slow leveling Pokemon to champion level, and then becomes champion. And I'm pretty sure she's the youngest champion, so she's not someone to mess with. And then finally, this is her best feat. This is what made her number 9 and not number 10. Canonically, she defeats every gym leader and champion in the Pokemon World Tournament, which includes trainers like Red, Blue, Lance, Steven, Wallace, Cynthia, and even Alder. And if this video is power scaling only in Timeline 1, where Red is defeated by Ethan on Mount Silver, then I would say that Rosa would probably be ranked around number 4 or 5 out of 11 on this list, even above Red. But since we're factoring in Timeline 2 and taking in all feats for each protagonist from both timelines, she has knocked down quite a few because she was featured in the generation right before gimmicks were a thing, and assumably when Timeline 2 was created. And gimmicks like Mega Evolution and Zemu skill these trainers very high. But yeah, those are our feats, and let's get into our ultimate Pokemon team. 
then I think she would have a superior Zoroark, Restram or Zekrom, Volcarona, Shiny Dragonite or Garchomp, and a Sawsbug. For Superior, she is shown battling with it in the animated trailer and in the official art for Pokemon Black and White too, as well as being partnered with it in Pokemon Masters. And I'm going to assume it's her starter Pokemon, so it's going to be one of her strongest Pokemon. For Zora Arc, she was gifted in Zora by Rude, and this is a Pokemon that was raised by a champion level trainer, so it's probably stronger than your average Joe. For Restram or Zekrom, it's unclear which one she obtains, but it is canonically confirmed that she is given one by N in their Light or Dark Stone. And as for their power, they're pretty equal because they both have Pokedex entries stating they can scorch the world with either fire or lightning, so their power skills are around surface level of the planet. Just like with Hilda, she probably has a Volcarona, and like I said before, it's unclear how strong Volcarona is since the only evidence we have with it is his Pokedex entries. But we do know it's going to be a high leveled Pokemon since Volcarona is a high leveled evolution. For Shiny Dragonite or Garchomp, after beating Banga, Banga canonically gives her a Shiny Dratini or Guybull. And I like to think that she chose the Guybull because I would say Garchomp is the stronger Pokemon. And finally, I couldn't really find any other strong Pokemon that she would canonically own, so I just threw in the Sawsbuck that she receives as a Deerling as a gift from the Weather Institute on Route 6. So not the most impressive team, but it's a team that defeated multiple champions, so it's a lot stronger than it looks. And yeah, the World Tournament feat is basically what puts Rosa over Elaine. Though it's a close call because Elaine does have a Mega Mewtwo and has also defeated a few champion level trainers like Red, Blue, and Green herself. So I'll leave it up to you in the comments on what y'all think. Next up, we have Red, and like I said before, Red is really messy because technically there are two versions of him. Without going into much detail, if I was just ranking his timeline one version, I would probably rank him just above Hilda. But since we're factoring in both timelines, his feats really do stack up. For one, he single-handedly took down Team Rocket with basically no help at all. He invaded the Team Rocket headquarters, saved all of Silph Co, and even defeated Giovanni and inspired him to dismantle Team Rocket. And along with that, with the help of Lorelei, he even wiped out a leftover branch in the Sevi Islands, which was supposedly the building blocks for Team Neo Rocket. Though, they didn't come to fruition three years later where Ethan would finish them off. So Red didn't entirely stop this resurrection, but he still did quite the number. Red also defeated two champions, which were Lance and Blue, and even held his position for three whole years until he relieved his title to go to Mount Silver to train. So technically, as champion, I'm going to assume that he went undefeated. So he's kind of like Leon for the Kanto and Johto regions in Timeline 1. And like I said earlier, he does make an appearance in the World Tournament and can be the final boss for the entire competition, though I'm pretty sure it's random, so the canonicity of this feat is pretty blurry. And for his last feat, in Timeline 2, Red is the final boss for the Battle Tree in the Alola region. And this probably features his most stat team in the games, where he wields a Mega Venusaur, Mega Charizard X or Y, and Mega Blastoise along with two Pokemon with Z-moves, being his Venusaur and Lapras. And you have to keep in mind that this is Red 10-15 to 15 years after he was defeated by Elaine in Let's Go. And in that battle, he had level 85 Pokemon across the board and was already considered a champion. So you can only imagine the progress he's made in the decade of him being absent. And if you watch Pokemon Generations Episode 1, it pretty much confirms that Red has traveled through every region up until Kalos. But it's up in the air whether or not he's defeated or captured any of the legendaries he encountered. But knowing Red, I'm sure he's able to do it, but it isn't confirmed. Alright, now let's go over his ultimate Pokemon team, and pretty much it's what you expect. I think it would consist of Pikachu, Charizard, Venusaur, Snorlax, Blastoise, and Mewtwo. And I think they're all pretty self-explanatory. But to explain their power, starting with Pikachu, this Pikachu held the title for the highest level Pokemon for 12 whole years until Cynthia's Garchomp tied it in Brilliant Diamond and Pearl. And along with that, it has a Light Ball, so it has enhanced stats. And it wouldn't surprise me if it's a partner Pokemon, since Red did cameo and let's go. Oh, and there's also a recent TCG card of Red's Pikachu in Gigantamax form, but it's questionable if this should be counted, and also Dynamaxing and Gigantamaxing isn't that strong since you can only do it in certain spots in the Galar region, so it really doesn't add much if it is counted. For Charizard, it has a case for being his strongest Pokemon because in Pokemon Origins, it was capable of weakening Mewtwo to the point where it was catchable, and also it can Mega Evolve into both its X and Y forms. And for Venusaur, Snorlax, Blastoise, and Mewtwo, there's nothing really extra about them besides Venusaur being able to use Z-moves, and of course Mewtwo's status as one of the strongest Pokemon to ever exist. But yeah, that's his team, and that's Red. Surprisingly, he ranks super low in this video, but in my heart, he will always be the GOAT. Next up, we have Victor, and when I started this video, I thought he had a lot of potential being the strongest protagonist for this list. But after a lot of digging, I came to the conclusion that he's more of a flashy trainer than a powerful trainer. And here I'll explain why. As we know, Victor defeated an undefeated champion, which I thought at first was a huge feat. 
But when it comes to Leon, he's only the undefeated champion of the Gal region, not the entire world. So for all we know, the trainers of the Gal region could just be mediocre. And since we're not factoring in the anime because it's just an entirely different universe, it's hard to scale Leon from just in-game material. Another flashy feat that I initially thought would be huge was the fact that Victor played a vital role in stopping the second Darkest Day, which consisted of him defeating and capturing an Eternamax Eternatus. Now don't get me wrong, Eternamax Eternatus is really strong. I mean, just in base form it defeated Leon, who is supposedly an undefeated champion. But when it comes to scaling it, it doesn't really live up to his name. Because for one, if you look at his sword potence entry, it states that the energy emanating from the lands of the Ga region is what keeps it active. So just from this dex entry alone, I will say Ichinata scales only to region level. And then for two, Ichinata is only skilled to the power of Zashian and Zamazenta together. Because canonically, these two Pokemon defeated it in its peak form when it actually caused the first darkest day. Which would mean that it had absorbed all the energy of the Ga region, but was still defeated by these two legendary Pokemon. And looking at Zashian and Zamazenta, there is no evidence that scales them past region level, so Eternatus isn't as strong as we thought it was. So when it comes to Victor scaling, I would say he scales to region level, since he canonically owns an Eternatus and a Zashian. So technically, if he wanted to, he could enact the second darkest day himself, and no one in the region would be able to stop him, since he requires both Zashian and Zamazenta to stop Eternamax Eternatus. And as for him defeating Eternatus in Eternamax form, it really isn't that of an impressive feat, since literally Zashian and Zamazenta could have just duoed it with no help from him. So yeah, two very flashy feats that don't have a lot of ground to them. And then to add in a few more feats, Victor was strong enough to pass all of Mustard's trials on the Isle of Armor, and also he canonically owns a ton of legendary Pokemon, which are two pretty solid feats. So yeah, with that, let's segue to his ultimate Pokemon team. So for his team, I think we'd have an Eternatus, Zashian, Urshifu, Calyrex, Silvalli, and then a random legendary Pokemon. And the reason why I say random is because canonically he entered the Dynamax Adventures dungeon to save Peony's daughter. So he definitely captures at least one legendary Pokemon, but we don't know which one for sure, since it's entirely random. So for all we know, he could have captured a Suicune, which scales to around city level, or he could have captured a Garantina, which scales to multi-universal level. But I think it'd be unfair to give Victor the benefit of the doubt and just give him a Garantina, which is the strongest Pokemon in there. Because because if we did that, then that alone would make him top 3 at least. So starting with Eternatus, as we know, he canonically captures one. And like I mentioned before, Eternatus scales to around region level. For Zashian, it canonically joins Victor's team as we see in Pokemon Evolutions Episode 1, since Victor is holding the Rust's sword. And I would say that Zashian is a stronger legend out of the two, since it has a move that can one-shot a Gigantamax Pokemon. For Urshifu, it is canonically gifted as a cup food to Victor from Mustard, and also it has the ability to Gigantamax, though unfortunately, it can only Gigantamax in the Galar region because Galar is the only place with power spots. So if Victor had home turf advantage, then he would be stronger. But if he's battling in, let's say, Kanto, then he's going to be nerfed quite a bit. For Calyrex, it canonically saw Victor worthy enough to join his team and lend his power. And I would say that it skills to around region level as well, since in ancient times, it once ruled over the Galar region. For Savali, it is canonically gifted as a Titan Null to Victor when he visits the Battle Tower. The employee states that it's a commemoration of his achievement of becoming champion, so I think it counts. And then we have the wildcard legendary Pokemon from the Dynamax Adventures Dungeon, which I've already explained before. And yeah, that's it for Victor. The reason why I scaled him above Red is simply because Red didn't save an entire region like Victor did, and the sheer amount of legendaries that Victor owns can't go unnoticed. I would say Victor has a power of two and a half regions with the possibility of going universal level if he happens to capture a Garantina. But since that's up in the air, he'll remain at rank seven for now. Next, we have Serena, and Serena and Calum are pretty interchangeable, but I chose Serena simply because she canonically owns an Evolutal. And I'll say canonically, Evolutal is more of a threat than Xerneas, but I'll get more into that later. Now, her biggest feat and why she was ranked over Victor is because of her involvement with Team Flare. As we know, she was vital to dismantling the villainous team, but more importantly, she quite literally saved the entire world by stopping Lissandre from completely firing the ultimate weapon, which would have wiped the Earth of all living things. And that's putting it lightly, because before even battling Lissandre, she takes on Evolutal, which I would say is a multi-continental threat, and then defeats it, and then canonically captures it. And then after that, she battles and stalls Lissandre enough to where the ultimate weapon runs out of most of his energy, making it less lethal to the planet, and eventually defeats Lissandre, the final boss of Team Flare. And if we're scaling Lissandre, he's a pretty powerful antagonist. Because for one, he managed to pseudo-capture Evolutal to use his power in order to fire the ultimate weapon. And even in Pokemon Masters, he canonically owns one, so this is a boss with a multi-continental level Pokemon on his side. And for two, he has access to Mega Evolution, specifically with his Mega Gyarados. And Mega Gyarados is an insanely strong Pokemon. I would think it'd be at least a region level powerhouse, since it has so many potency trees that mission that it can easily destroy cities, even major ones. And its Mega Pokedex entry states that it becomes even stronger. So Lissandre is pretty stacked. 
So Serena overpowers a multi-continental threat Pokemon and then captures it, and then faces Lissandre, which at this state is around region level, defeats him, and then saves the world. And then makes a great escape from the collapsing ultimate weapon somehow. So she's pretty amazing. All right, let's get into her team. And I think she would have a Delphox, Greninja, Lucario, Blastoise, Evolto, and a Mewtwo. For Delphox, it is seen in every official art it's featured in as a Finnegan with Serena. So this would be Serena's starter Pokemon and like one of her strongest. For Greninja, it is seen with Serena in the Gacha music video facing Mewtwo, which means that it was strong enough to help weaken it for Serena to capture it, which scales it up pretty dang high. For Lucario, it is gifted from Karina since it had taken a liking to Serena, and it also has the ability to Mega Evolve, so it is also a powerhouse. For Blastoise, it's likely that Serena chose Squirtle for a Kanto starter from Professor Sycamore, since we see it with Serena facing Evolto, and also it as well can Mega Evolve. For Evolto, she canonically has to defeat it or capture it to progress the story, and I know she faces an Evolto because she is depicted in promotional art facing one. And to look back to why I think Evolto is a stronger legendary over Exerneus, it's simply because it has the ability to suck all life force around it, and since its energy was going to be used for the ultimate weapon to wipe out the entire planet, I would say it's a multi-continental level Pokemon, so that is why I chose Serena over Callum. And finally, with Mewtwo, she canonically defeats it or captures it in the Unknown Cave, since there's dialogue that states that only champions can enter the dungeon. And just like with her Lucario and Blastoise, her Mewtwo can Mega Evolve too. So again, another case of a very strong Mewtwo owned by a protagonist, but thankfully this is the final one. And finally, for the extra category, Serena actually has a few interesting attributes about her. For one, she is probably an Aura user, since Karina's Lucario took a liking to her. Though, it's not confirmed, but I'm gonna go on a limb and say that she has the potential to be an Aura user. And for two, she is potentially immortal, since she was right by the ultimate weapon when Lissandra fires it. Lissandra even tells her that he'll give Serena and her friends eternal life right before he fires it. And if this is true and she does have immortality, then I would guess eventually Serena could achieve a higher ranking, since she can live forever and train indefinitely, unless she's buried alive like Lissandra was. But I don't think no matter what she does, she'll ever achieve the status of the strongest protagonist because the top three are just ridiculous. So let's move on. Next up, we have Mei, who to my surprise made it to the top five. Now, besides single-handedly taking down Team Aqua and Magma with a little help from Steven, what scales Mei so high is for the fact that she saved the world not once, but twice. As we know, Mei was chosen by Steven and Wallace to enter the Cave of Origin to stop Primal Kyogre from drowning the world. And these are both champion caliber trainers who for some reason decided that Mei was the best option, even when one of them was the standing champion of the entire region. And I know, Mei was given the Red Orb, which nerfed Kyogre's power, but you have to keep in mind that Primal Kyogre was in the core of the Cave of Origin, a place that directly gives Primal Kyogre its power. And Mei literally went in there by herself and encountered this multi-continental level Pokemon in his home territory and managed to defeat it and capture it with just her team, which is a feat that only the likes of Serena has done thus far in this video. But what places Mei over Serena is that she saved the world for a second time, and this time I would say it was even a bigger feat with a stronger Pokemon. Because in the Delta episode of Omega Ruby and Ava Sapphire, Zinnia summons Rayquaza to save the world, since if you didn't know, there was a giant meteor that was approaching. And after Mei's meteorite allows Rayquaza to Mega Evolve, Zinnia, a dragonite from an ancient tribe that literally worships Rayquaza and can summon it by praying, turns to Mei and says that only she can win over Rayquaza and quote, master it. Meaning that Mei was strong enough to overpower this above planetary legendary Pokemon. I would even go as far to say that Mega Rayquaza could possibly be a solar system level Pokemon. So in short, this is a humongous feat. And once Mei canonically defeats it and captures it, she flies it to outer space and destroys a planet-destroying meteor with one blow, and then defeats a Wimpy Deoxys, which clearly has no evidence of being anywhere near Mega Rayquaza's level. So you can say that Mei was the chosen one for both world-ending events, like literally. She was chosen by two champions and was chosen by a Dracodin member who knows everything one needs to know about Rayquaza. So Mei is a pretty big deal. So with that, let's get into her team, and I think she would have a Blaziken, Swampert, Latios, Kyogre, Rayquaza, and a Deoxys. For Blaziken and Swampert, they are most likely her first two Pokemon since we see them a lot in promotional art with Mei, and along with that we see Mei fighting with them in the animated trailer for Oras. And as you would expect, both of them can Mega Evolve. For Latios, it canonically joins the base team after she defeats a few Team Aqua members that's harassing its homeland. And I know Latios joins her team because in the animated trailer she is seen riding on a Mega Latios, which if you notice has yellow eyes. For Kyogre, since she obtains a Latios, that means she must have defeated and captured a Primal Kyogre. Since in Alpha Sapphire, these are the two Pokemon that you obtain. And like I mentioned earlier, Primal Kyogre is a multi-continental level Pokemon, which basically means that it's very strong. 
And finally, for Rayquaza, like I mentioned before, it is canonically captured by Mei. And like we know, Mega Rayquaza can overpower both Primal Kyogre and Groudon together, and even destroy a planet ending meteor. Which means that it probably scales to around planetary level, and it could probably destroy Earth if it wanted to. So canonically, this is one of the strongest Pokemon that has ever exist. And yeah, that's why Mei scales above Serena. She has insanely strong Pokemon, and has saved the world twice. But even with these massive feats, she's probably no competition for the next one on this list. So, let's move on. Next up, we have Ilio, and man, Ilio and Selene break the mold when it comes to scaling in this video. This is where we go from multi-continental level to possibly universal level. And so with that, let's jump right into their feats. Now, I think there are three solid feats worth mentioning for Elio that explain why he is number four. The first feat is that he canonically defeats Red at Red's peak. And remember, this is Red 10 to 15 years after Elaine defeated him in Let's Go in Timeline 2. And it goes without saying that Red in this battle is above champion level. He is quite literally at battle legend level, for whatever that means. But as impressive as his feat is, it doesn't even compare it to the next two. Because these two feats is what really scales Elio to star level to even possibly universal level. So getting into the second feat, Elio canonically travels to Ultra Megapod and saves the world and possibly other worlds by defeating Ultra Necrozma. And when it comes to scaling Ultra Necrozma, I would say that it's around star level. Because canonically when Necrozma was at its peak, which was during the era when the people of Ultra Megapolis broke Necrozma with farming its energy, its light would literally peek through wormholes to several planets. So when it comes to its energy levels, it scales very high, higher than dummy Eternatus. And you also have to remember that Necrozma just in base form is stronger than Solgaleo and Lunala, which are both around planetary level. Because when Necrozma transforms into his dust mane and Dawnwing forms, his Pokedex history states that it's devouring Solgaleo, or that Lunala has no longer a will of his own, meaning that it's completely dominating these legendary Pokemon. And on top of that, if you didn't know, the Z crystals that are found in the Alola region are thought to be remnants of Necrozma's broken body. And as we know, these crystals amplify Pokemon's moves, and even make some of them totem Pokemon. So with just that alone should give you an idea on how powerful Necrozma is, and Ily went in there by himself and single handedly took down Ultra Necrozma when it was in a rage. And as impressive as that feat is, I still don't think it compares to the last one, which is what scales Ilya to such higher levels than his predecessor, May. And that feat is, is that he canonically defeats all of Team Rainbow Rocket single-handedly, which I would say is the strongest villainous organization in any Pokemon game hands down. Because not only does it consist of every boss from every previous Pokemon game, but it consists of every boss that succeeded in their respective universes, meaning that they own their box art legendary Pokemon and took over their worlds. So these are the best of the best. So that means Ilya defeated Maxi, Archie, Lissandre, and Getsus with their multi-continental level Pokemon, Giovanni with his Mega Mewtwo which goes to around multi-continental to star level, it's very unclear, and finally Cyrus with his high universal level Pokemon. And I would say out of the bunch, the only one that's relevant is Cyrus with his Dialga or Polkia, which are literally god Pokemon that scale to around high universal level. So with Ilya canonically defeating Cyrus's Dialga or Polkia, does that mean that he scales to godly proportions? Since, as we know, Dialga can manipulate time and Polkia can manipulate space? Well, I'm not sure, but I'm going to put a strong maybe on that. But what I do know for sure is that Ilya scales to around star level because of his Necrozma. But yeah, defeating Team Rainbow Rocket is a humongous feat. So, with all of that, let's jump into his ultimate Pokemon team. And I think that he would have two Solgaleos, Necrozma, Zygarde, Naganadol, and Silvalli. For his two Solgaleos, we know that Lily Solgaleo went to the joint Ilios team so that it could grow stronger. And for the second Solgaleo, we know that a rift appears after Ilio becomes champion, and it's most likely that he went and caught the Cosmog at the Altar of the Sun, which in turn would evolve into Solgaleo. And when it comes to scaling Solgaleo, I would say it's around solar system levels since it could hop through ultra wormholes, and it's said that it devours entire suns. Oh, and the reason why I gave Ilio a Solgaleo and not a Lunalong is simply because in Episode 2 of Pokemon Evolutions, we see Selene battling a Dawnwing's Necrozma. So I thought naturally that Ilio would get the opposite one, which would be the Dust Main Necrozma. For Necrozma, like I mentioned before, Ilio canonically defeats it on Ultra Megapolis and then captures it in base form in Alola. And as we know, it is around star level when it comes to his strength. For Zygarde, Ilio is canonically tasked by Cena and Dexio to travel around Alola finding Zygarde cells and cores. And I'm going to assume that he found all of them and used them to resemble Zygarde into his complete form. And when it comes to scaling Zygarde, I would say it's around service level to the planet. Just like Reshiram, it could probably affect worldwide ecosystems. For Naga Dull, after Ilio vanquishes Ultra Necrozma, the Ultra Recon Squad gives him a Poi Pole for his help. And finally for Savali, Wick gives Ilio a Type Null with all of his memories. And yeah, that's Ilio, he is unbelievably strong. And if there's anything extra about him, it's probably the fact that he's able to use Z-moves and Mega Evolution. But that's pretty insignificant when comparing to his other feats. So with that, let's move on to the top three. Next we have Ethan, and funny enough, Ethan was originally ranked last under Hilda for this video. But then my friend Carthur reminded me of something that literally scaled Ethan from being the weakest protagonist to the third strongest. So on that note, let's get into his feats. 
Now, the Ethan we know is only present in Timeline 1, where he defeats Red on Mount Silver. And really, besides dismantling Team Neo Rocket, defeating a stronger Giovanni, and gaining 16 gym badges, this was his best feat, until that little reminder that brought him up to the top. And that feat is, is that he canonically temporarily owns an Arceus and is given permission to enter the Sinjar Ruins, where he supposed Arceus reveals how he created the Pokemon universe and gives Ethan a newly born god Pokemon. And the reason why I state that it's temporarily owned is because Ethan can only enter the Sinjar Ruins if he has an Arceus in his party. But there are no events at Heart Gold and Soul Silver where Ethan can canonically obtain one. But at the same time, it is canon that Ethan does enter the Sinjar Ruins and is given a god Pokemon by Arceus, since there is text in game with Cynthia present and there is promotional art of Ethan receiving the god Pokemon. So it's very ambiguous, and if we're giving Ethan the benefit of the doubt, he would own an Arceus, which would make him the strongest protagonist for this video, just because of this event. But since we can't prove how he obtains an Arceus with just an in-game material, I can't warrant giving him an Arceus. So we're just going to say that Arceus gave Ethan permission to enter the Syndra Ruins because he saw him worthy enough. So just with the one god Pokemon he is given is what scales him to the third strongest protagonist. And of course, the strongest god Pokemon of the three is 100% Garatina. So this Garatina is quite literally carrying Ethan on his back. And funny enough, there's an actual method getting a second god Pokemon from Arceus, but that requires a different Arceus from the first one, like a completely new one. But it gets kind of messy at that point, so we're just going to say there's one Arceus, and Ethan only gets one god Pokemon. But again, if we gave Ethan the benefit of the doubt, he would canonically own two Arceuses, a Garatina and a Dialga or Polkia, which would make him by far the strongest protagonist. It would be just no contest. But then again, it's hard to prove. So with that gigantic feat, let's get into his ultimate Pokemon team. And I think that he would own a shiny Gyarados, Dragonite, Lugia or Ho-Oh, Suicune, Celebi, and finally his Garatina. For shiny Gyarados, Dragonite, Lugia or Ho-Oh, and Suicune, they are all Pokemon that Ethan canonically captures or is given to progress the story. For Celebi, even though it's an event Pokemon, it is still canon since there's a backstory with Ethan canonically defeating a stronger version of Giovanni, who wanted to get out of hiding and return to Team Rocket. And finally for his Garatina, like I mentioned before, it is gifted by the Pokemon God himself, Arceus. And as for scaling Garatina, it probably reaches extra dimensional level like we see in Pokemon Platinum, which basically means that it's very, very strong. And yeah, that's Ethan, one of the wildest protagonists in Pokemon. But even with that one massive feat, he is still beaten by another protagonist. And I'm sure by now you have an idea who's going to be. So let's move on. Next up, we have Lucas and Dawn, and these two protagonists are pretty dead even when it comes to power and notability. But for the sake of the video, I'll choose Lucas for this slot. Now, there really is one feat I need to cover to explain why Lucas is the second strongest protagonist. And to get right into it, it is for the fact that he canonically defeats and captures Dialga, Polkia, and Garatina while simultaneously saving multiple universes. And that's it, just from that one feat alone makes him top two. Nothing really else needs to be said. Like, just the fact that Dialga and Polka could destroy the entire universe together speaks louder than words. And that Garatina was able to overpower both of them shows that Garatina is above universal level. So yeah, Lucas is a god among us and only needs one feat to show how strong he is. So I guess with that, let's jump into his ultimate Pokemon team. And to put this simply, all he needs is Garatina, Dialga, and Polkia to be ranked above Ethan. The rest of his Pokemon team don't really matter. And if you're wondering, in the post game, Lucas can spawn both Dialga and Polkia with the adamant and lustrous orbs that he finds as Spear Pillar. And I would say that it's fair game since the items appear after you become champion and talk to Cynthia's grandmother. And yeah, that's basically it. That is Lucas. He is the second strongest protagonist in Pokemon by far. But it makes you wonder, who on earth is stronger than him? Well, let's find out. And finally, the strongest protagonist in Pokemon is... Ray in the card. And yes, Legends Arceus counts as a main series Pokemon game according to the Pokemon website, so it's fair game for Ray and Akari. And it's funny, it is highly likely that Ray and Akari are actually Lucas and Dawn, but from the future. And if that is true, it only adds on to the testament of how strong these trainers are. Either way, Ray and Akari are the strongest by far, like extremely far. And all I need to say is one word, Arceus. Yeah, they canonically defeat a portion of Arceus, and Arceus blesses them with that portion to join their team. And when I say portion, supposedly the Arceus that we know is only a fragment of the entire entity that is known as Arceus. There's a good reason why it's stated that Arceus has a thousand arms. But to put it simply, Ray and Akari canonically have the power of God on their side, and that's all they need to be ranked above Lucas and Dawn, and as the strongest protagonist in Pokemon. As we saw with Ethan, Arceus easily created a brand new god Pokemon with no hassle at all. So I would say that Arceus is boundless, which is the highest tier that I could find in power scaling. So yeah, Ray and Akari are broken and demigods and no other protagonist can stop them. Not even if every protagonist before them joined forces and battled them all at once. Ray and Akari would defeat them easily. So they are definitely the strongest. 
Oh, also for the fun of it, I made a quick chart showing the power scaling from trainer to trainer, and as you can see, Rei and Akari are just out of this world. So yeah, they do be the strongest though. And there you go, Akari and Rei are the strongest protagonists in Pokemon. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you enjoyed this video, you should check out my one fact for every main character in Pokemon video. It includes the protagonists from the games, manga, and even the anime. And don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell.